So while the privilege of frame, opening and framing the conference is mine today, I would like to recognize that the program of the conference is a collective brainchild of the five members of the SCORA Executive Committee. The names have already been mentioned. In 2006, the Environmental Ministry of the UK, at the time called DEFRA, published a commissioned report on how to induce citizens to reduce their electricity consumption. The goal was to develop policies aimed at changing people's behavior by providing incentives and instantaneous feedback on domestic electricity use. Several implicit assumptions underline the DEFRA's initi initiative. One, that reducing demand is just as important as pursuing energy efficiency and renewable resources. Two, that energy consumption, or any other consumption for that matter, in people's personal lives is a matter of a rational individual choice. Three, that information and incentives are the key factors in changing these individual choices. And fourth, that public policy aiming to reduce consumption should focus on behavior modification. What a difference a few years make. Of these four implicit assumptions in DEFRA uh, action at the time, only the first one, the one that there is a need to reduce demand, to reduce consumption, still holds. What is now becoming widely accepted is that consumption is not a rational individual choice, rather it's a collective social process taking place in the context of a particular economic system, a consumer society. To understand the phenomenon of mass consumption, it helps to consider through it through multiple lenses. So let me highlight four of these lenses. So one, consumption is very much part of people's search for meaning and well-being. We acquire material goods to demonstrate love, generosity, and gratitude to express individuality, gain approval from peers and parents, compete for a mate, to satisfy curiosity, match the lifestyles of a social group to which we belong or aspire, to have a standing in a community, to satisfy the yearnings for well-being and security. But in a consumer society, these natural human instincts and yearnings are exploited, perpetually magnified, and ultimately distorted. Carol Graham has done interesting studies around the world on human search for happiness and well-being. She will talk about the, the results of her work during the plenary session on Thursday after lunch. So another lens. Through this lens, consumption is an invisible part of everyday lives. Widely practiced routines and rituals, scripts written by the society at large. These social practices, as most of you know, um, are at work when we attend to personal hygiene, seek comfortable and healthy homes, partake in celebrations, pursue personal mobility and access to the life amenities, and when we care for our family and friends. Many of these practices involve interactions with technology in a circular, mutually reinforcing way, which means designers and promoters of technology in everyday lives play a central law, role in the evolution of these social practices. 
but in a consumer society, the mutually reinforcing relationship between technology and social practices tends to push towards more complexity, more amenities, and more volume, hence more consumption. Through a third lens, consumption is intricately linked to dominant socio-technical system, such as, for example, an automobile or the system for generation and distribution of energy. The stability and resistance to change of such socio-technical systems is a very well-known phenomenon. And in the consumer society, the resistance to socio -technical, of socio-technical system to change often comes hand in hand with the resistance to change in consumption patterns. This is because consumption is often at the core of the system's stability. Finally, using the economical lens to look at mass consumption, uh, mass consumption has been the engine of the post-war rise in great national wealth. During these post-war years, the prospect of mass consumption also carried with it the promise of intergenerational upward social mobility, greater equality, and stronger democracy. It all came together. Consumer culture is a construct that emerged through concerted strategic efforts of governments and the free market. Our keynote speaker today, Sheldon Garon, will tell a fascinating story about that. And in a consumer society in which about 70%, at least in the US, of GDP consists of private spending, it's truly a challenge to envision a radical reduction in consumption without triggering a widespread disaster. The mass consumption is more than the bedrock of economy and culture. It provides stability to the major societal institutions and the political process. At the same time, for most people, this great aggregate wealth has not translated to greater well-being or a sense of security. Indicators of happiness and social well-being, as you know, have not risen for decades. This economy has produced the growing disparities of wealth and income, work spent treadmill, and declining leisure time for those who, can, who are better off and a massive personal debt in all but the highest income categories. So these are these four lenses through which I am looking at the, the phenomenon of mass consumption. And by looking at it from these four lenses, I am led to several observations that are relevant to this conference. For one thing, it is clear that to generate knowledge and understanding about self-sustaining power of consumerism and about the possible transition into a post-consumer society requires that we bring into the conversation researchers from a wide range of disciplines and scholarly traditions. And this is what this conference is trying to accomplish through the four tracks, A, B, C, D. Secondly, consumerism, consumerism is in fact a complex system. For that reason, I believe that the single-issue public policies aimed at reducing consumption are unlikely to be effective and are unlikely to produce unequivocally widely shared public good. So for instance, a carbon tax, even if it were politically possible, might reduce overall consumption but would further increase wealth inequalities. 
so might a mandated shortening of a work week espoused by some as a way to reduce consumption. And there will be more discussion following this session on this topic. Uh, Nicholas Ashford will talk about that idea of shortening of work week in a dedicated session today. And on Friday, Juliet Shore and John de Graff in a plenary will also have a conversation about that. In fact, we ought to ask ourselves this. In what ways is policy, as is commonly understood, and my definition is, as a course of action undertaken to address, almost always incrementally, a well-recognized specific collective problem. So in what ways public policy so defined is useful for reducing consumption? In what circumstances is public policy not useful at all? We can only imagine public policy being very effective in the area of mobility, personal mobility, for example. But it's, is it, can it be equally effective in, for example, when we start thinking about the built environment, the, home, the housing construction, house construction sector? So we have several, there is another related question. What can we learn from policy experiences across localities, countries, continents, and globally? We have several distinguished speakers uh, that from UN, European Environmental Agency, and the EPA that will talk about those aspects of uh, changes in consumption. My final observation is this. Contemplating the future of consumerism or its demise in favor of an alternative is a subversive and deeply political act. If the phenomenon of mass consumption provides stability to major societal institution and the political process, then it follows that there are powerful and determined agents poised to protect the status quo. That's pretty obvious. And this observation triggers some intriguing questions. Can grassroots social, sociotechnical, and business innovations actually facilitate a transition toward post-consumer values and toward an alternative basis of the economy? Some think yes, some are doubtful. Another question is, is the free market capable of producing a sustainable business model whose success does not depend on ever expanding consumer economy? Expanding, I'm sorry, consumer economy. I address this question to John Fullerton, who will be talking in a plenary on Friday morning. What's the relationship between these two visions of post-consumer society and of a new economy, as the idea of the new economy is, begin is beginning to get more visibility? Are they related? Are these two framings of the same thing? And if they are closely related, is this an opening for a new social movement toward a different type of economy and value system? Bob Massey of New Economics Institute will address that question after dinner tonight. And if there was a social movement, what would it look like? Something like a march on Wall Street? Or civil disobedience? Or some other form that we have not thought of? So the dialogue track E provides the platform for considering these and related questions. Track E in this conference is a place where researchers and practitioners can engage together in thinking of agents and strategies for change while drawing on a knowledge base presented in tracks A and D, A to D. 
So this is in essence the mission of SCORI, to facilitate development of knowledge and understanding and to see that that knowledge and understanding nurture social innovation and radical change. Thank you.